All right, so we are going to discuss trauma, kind of the basics that you need to know. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll tell you, I finished this lecture last night and I was, wasn't that happy with it because I was like, there's so much more that they need to know about trauma, but I only have half an hour to talk about it. So use this as a launching pad to go out and learn some other stuff. Obviously in, in all your training, you can get some more information, but just know this is the very tip of the iceberg in terms of trauma. What I wanted to leave you with is some exam pearls, so very important clinical findings, some common DCAP ETLS. What's our DCAP ETLS, everyone know? They're still using it? Yeah. All your physical exam findings you're going to find on someone, and then life-saving or sustaining maneuvers. So again, just the very tip of the iceberg. So we're going to go through in a systems approach. So head trauma. The exam findings we're going to talk about are GCS, our pupil exam, and then any DCAP BTS findings. So Glasgow Coma Scale. It determines the level of consciousness. A minimum is three, so please do not come in with a GCS of zero patient. We're, we might laugh at you. I'm sorry, but we might laugh at you. We like to say even the sheets on the bed have a GCS of three because the way the system was built, you can only have a three. You can't go lower. Maximum is five. This is a score that was built for trauma and built for head trauma. So we use it in everything, but it kind of gets overused. Uh, we use it a lot for medical evaluations, but again, it's specific to trauma. We always hear that GCS less than eight intubate is kind of a saying, but that only has to do with head trauma. Uh, so your GCS less than eight, who's a sepsis or someone else, it doesn't really fit. So just know that it is more of a trauma score. This is how I remembered it whenever I learned a long time ago, EVM 456, and that's, that's kind of how I remember it. We have the eyes, and there's only four points in the eyes. Verbal is five points, and motor is six points. So here, here's the scoring right here, a one for eyes. They don't open their eyes. So now, no matter what you do, they keep their eyes closed. That's a one. Open to pain, so sternal rub, nipple twist, they open their eyes to pain, that's a two. Open to voice, hey sir, open your eyes. They open their eyes. And four is open spontaneous, so they're sitting there with their eyes open. As you can see, the score is very subjective, and most studies show a lot of variability between what you'd call a GCS of 14 and you'd call a GCS of 14. It's very subjective, because maybe their eyes are closed because they're just closed, and so they're a four as opposed to a five. So it, it's a very subjective scoring. Verbal, if they don't say anything. Two is incomprehensible speech. Three is inappropriate speech. Four is confused, so they're talking to you, but they don't really know what day it is. Five is A and O times three. Everything's good to go. Motor, uh, one is none. Two is abnormal extension. So this is abnormal extension. All right, what is this called? You guys so yeah, so this is the cerebrate posturing. So that's badness. Um, abnormal flexion to three, decorticate posturing. Withdrawal from pain, so you pinch them here and they kind of go like that. Localized pain, so you pinch them here and they try to swatch you away. And follows commands. See, and very subjective. I usually start in my head, because I never get this right. Um, the trauma surgeon always asks the resident, what's the GCS? And in my head, I'm like, shit, I don't know what the GCS is. Because I, I just can't, it cannot compute that fast in my brain. I usually start at a six or a 15 and I go down. I, I mark stuff off. All right, they're not doing this, they're not doing this. And I kind of mark stuff off. But use, an, use a chart, use an app. It's just, it's not something you have to put to memory because I don't think it's as important as we make it out to be. So pupil signs, what we want to know, are they... Big, small, or in the middle, are they equal? Do they react to light? And voluntary movement, because can they use their extraocular muscles to look left and right, look up, down? So right here, what's abnormal about this? Yeah, one's big, one's small, and honestly, you can't really tell which is which. One could be smaller than the normal one, one could be bigger than the other one. This is most likely blown. So a couple things. This could be from, what do you think? Head trauma. Head trauma. Could be from intoxication. Usually you'd, you'd expect both to either be big or small. If they're both really small and pinpoint, what do we think of? Narcotics, Narcotics yeah. Uh, very big can be cocaine and some other intoxicants. Uh, one big on one side. We worry about something going on in the brain causing increased intracranial pressure. What that does is push on certain centers of the brain and cause a pupil uh, to go big. Uh, also, they could have just gone to the eye doctor. That's a good question to ask. Uh, it could always be like this. Uh, it, it, it just could be that they had surgery. Glass eyes, you, I can't m tell you how many times I've got an abnormal pupil exam and they say, oh yeah, by the way, this eye is fake. Well, thanks. Um, so you never know. So ask questions. Did, did you have a surgery recently? Have you been told your eyes always big? Some people have anisocoria where eye, one eye is always big. And they, a lot of people know that because every time they look in the mirror, they say, oh, one eye is kind of big. Yeah, yeah, it's about 10% of people. 
So DCAP ETL, so we want to know the size, location, bleeding, is it pulsatile or oozing, and is there exposed skull or brain matter? So those are some important things. A lot of times they come in, you get to them, the engine crew has already wrapped them up with gauze. You being the medics, if you're on the engine crew, you've already wrapped them up with gauze. And that's great, but please take a quick look at it. It's nice to know when they come to the trauma center what we're dealing with. So many times, oh, it's already wrapped up, I didn't want to look. But it really helps us know, is there a 10 centimeter lack? Is it a tiny nick that's bleeding a lot? Because facial and head wounds tend to bleed a lot. So take a quick look. Pulsatile versus oozing can sometimes tell us arterial versus venous, and that may wor change our workup. So what are these? Battle signs. Raccoon eyes. What's this a sign of? Do you know? Basal yeah, basal or skull fractures. So down here, the basal skull area, uh, if you get fractures, they can manifest this. This could just be a black eye. The guy got punched. Could be that they got hit back here. But we worry about basal or skull fracture, and that might change the, the CAT scans that we get in the trauma center. So kind of subtle findings that you want to look for. What's that? It's a lack with, a, with skull exposed. You see this a lot. Uh, MVCs, the visor catches their head. I've seen a complete scalping. It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, this is this is skull right here. Take it out or leave it in. Please leave it in. <laughs> so what do you? And it's very basic uh, medical EMS. But what do you want to do with this? Cover both eyes. Don't let the patient look around. All that good stuff. What's that? Yeah. He might still be alive, but technically he's going to die. It's brain matter. So this, this helps us know if you see exposed brain matter or we saw brain matter on scene. That really actually helps us. Because if we're coding someone and brain matter was on scene from a GSW, the out outcome is pretty dismal. So we might end that code a little earlier. Any questions on head trauma? I didn't even put a treatment in here because there's not much treatment. Uh, if they're altered, look for other causes, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, like we talked about before. But there's not many specific head trauma treatments. Direct pressure for bleeding, which we'll talk about a little later. All right, we'll do spine trauma. So spinal exam, DCAP BTLS is what we'll go over. So spinal exam, palpate the spine. You have three regions of the spine. You have the cervical, you have the uh, thoraco and lumbar right here. So just palpate the spine. Let us know if you felt any abnormalities or any specific pain. Before you get them on the backboard, while you're rolling them again on the board, just do a quick spinal exam. It helps us know what you felt and if anything has changed in, in your exam as well. Obviously, while you're back there, look for gunshots, stabbings, anything that might be missed while they're on the board. Neurovascular exam, this is just showing all the dermatomes of every nerve. So you can see, neurovascular exam is really complex, a true neurovascular exam, because each nerve innervates a different section of the body. So if you're actually doing like full sensory exam and all that stuff, it takes a long time, it's very complex. We need a basic one. Well, if I was doing a neuro exam on you, hey, can you stick out your hands for me? I want you to squeeze my hands nice and hard, pull against me, now push against me. Good, I've really knocked out a lot of these. One, he follows commands. And I really have knocked out a lot of these. I know the upper spine's pretty darn good. Now I have him push down on my hands, pull your toes back towards you, lift your legs off the bed. That's enough for us. Uh, you, you know all your major nerve and muscle systems are working. So what we do in the trauma center, you'll see us give us two thumbs up, wiggle your toes. So again, what that has told us is at least the nerves up here are somewhat intact, the nerves down here are somewhat intact, and the patient is mentating enough to follow commands. So thumbs up, wiggle your toes. Yeah. Take it in or leave it out? Yeah, leave that in there, please. <laughs> Same with that one. Badness. <laughs> What's this? So not hanging seatbelt sign. So yeah, where where is this patient in the car? Driver. Yeah, driver. So seatbelt sign coming across here. So it's a sign that's good for us to know. Um, it kind of helps our work up a little bit. What that shows is that one, they had a seatbelt on, so that helps too. Uh, two, two it, sh it, it could be a possible indicator of underlying <laughs> injury. Some more recent research says not that important, but it does help us. It shows us they had a good enough mechanism that they really were jolted against their seatbelt. They weren't just going two miles an hour and hit something. So that's a seatbelt sign. And then we do start worrying about injury to the carotids up here. So if we see this and the person isn't acting right or kind of has a neuro deficit, we're going to be scanning their carotid arteries because they could have an a, a, a injury to that. So spinal immobilization, I put this in quotes because this isn't the most current term. Right now, they're mainly using spinal motion restriction because you can't actually immobilize the spine. Uh, but this is what is called in your SOGs, it's Appendix O. And here are the JFRD indications for mobilization. So numbness, tingling, or motor weakness. Spinal tenderness, so you run down the spine and say, oh, that hurts. Neck pain with range of motion. 
head injury with GCS less than 15, or quote, significant mechanism of injury. Obviously, this is very subjective. There are some examples in your SOGs, but this is currently what your SOGs state. Um, my next slide here is tip of the iceberg because this is 1% of the iceberg when it comes to spinal mobilization. If you're up to date with EMS evidence, you know a lot of places are getting away from backboards and some even from sea collars. There's never been a single study to show any benefit to a backboard. There's actually evidence of harm. So if you come across an EMS system that isn't using backboards, that's why. And and uh, JFRD has fairly progressive protocols in terms of who needs it. It's not just everyone blindly gets it, but still, probably a majority of people backboarded in the field don't need to be. But again, it's a lot of onus to put on you guys to determine that, and your medical direction is still evaluating that right now. But if you come across agencies that have thrown out backboards or thrown out sea collars, that's why a lot of all the evidence is kind of pushing that way currently. So helmet removal, again, very quick, just because it's in your SOGs. It says remove all helmets except football helmets. But you want to keep football helmets, you want to take them off if they're in cardiac arrest or airway compromise. Obviously get the helmet out of the way. If they have no shoulder pads, because the idea of the helmet is to restrict motion with the shoulder pads. If you have obvious head or facial trauma, or poor fit that's making the cervical area unstable. So motorcycle helmets come off. So in general, uh, football helmets stay on if they have the pads on. If You can always take the screws off to get to them, but if there's any, if the patient's critical or any worry, just take the darn thing off. All right, so spine trauma. There's a specific type of injury, a spinal injury, patient has persistent hypotension and bradycardia. Do you know what that's called? So it can have to do with what's, you know, the term is called neurogenic shock. Some people say spinal shock as well. But just it's something interesting to know because if, it, all of us, if we're hypotensive, we expect tachycardia. Our body's going to compensate for it. So it's interesting if you get that football player who's having some neuro deficits, some numbness, tingling, weakness, and you realize, man, their pressure is 80, but their pulse is 50. That doesn't make sense. It's, it's this interesting phenomenon where you knock out some of your autonomic nerves with your spinal injury, and it doesn't allow your body to compensate. So it's kind of interesting. In your protocols, it includes dopamine. That We're kind of going away from dopamine in general with a lot of things, but that is one that we still use a bit for neurogenic shock. Because what you actually need to do is put this person on vasopressors. Because all the fluids in the world isn't going to help because their body's not able to compensate for it. So just if you see this, just know that's what's going on. And it would be great for us to know, hey, I'm worried about neurogenic shock. This, this guy's pulse has been 50. Because you'd expect a, a high heart rate. Any questions on spinal neck trauma? Chest trauma, so we're going to go over visual inspection, auscultation, and decap BTLS. So the main things we're going to look at for visual are flail chest, unequal rise, and a sucking chest wound. So auscultation, there's really nothing to put up here, just listen to the lung fields, listen to the top and the bottom, both sides. Tell us if, there, if there's decreased breath sounds. Just know that in general you do get decreased breath sounds on your left side because the heart is there. <laughs> It seems like every patient we have has decreased breath sounds on the left side, but just make sure you check a little bit lateral because since your heart is here, you're going to get decreased breath sounds. But it helps us to know if you don't hear breath sounds on, the, on one side. What's this? <laughs> Continuation of our seatbelt sign. Exactly, come down the chest. So again, could be an indicator of underlying injury. <laughs> yeah, don't take that out. Go ahead and leave that in. Uh, not on the patient, but a good thing to note. It's nice to know that the steering wheel looked like this because yeah, that's a good indicator of some ch chest trauma. Um, I love the photos that you guys bring in to show us what the car looks like. That helps a lot. And if I see this, I'm going to be a little more worried about some of the chest because that was a pretty severe impact. So this is what a flail, flail chest looks like. So as you can see, as he takes a, this is a breath in right here. He takes a breath in, that side goes down. So breath in, you expect it to come out, but it's paradoxical movement. So every breath he takes, this section of rib goes down. So flail chest is multiple ribs broken in multiple places where you now have a floating island of rib, and it's a paradoxical movement. So for flail chest, not much to do other than pain, pain control and avoid CPAP. Why do we avoid CPAP? Could be a, it could be a pneumothorax, and you really don't want to put pressure into a pneumothorax unless you want to avoid CPAP in these people. So what? this is a sucking chest wound. So a sucking chest wound essentially is just an opening in the, in the uh, lung wall and the lung itself. It's, it's allowing a two-way valve of air. So the patient breathes in, negative pressure brings the air in, patient breathes out, positive pressure blows it out. So as you can tell, that probably doesn't 
cause the best type of breathing um, because your, your air is going back and forth ac across the chest wall. So the way to treat this, we've all learned about the three-sided occlusive dressing. So you can take a Vaseline gauze, you can peel off one, one side of it so you actually have the sticky Vaseline gauze, put it on there, tape three sides, and what that does is when the person breathes in, it occludes it so it doesn't allow air to come in. And when they breathe out, it burps that, that wound and it allows air out so you're not actually uh, trapping air in there. Again, it may just improve the respiratory status. <clears throat> tension pneumothorax. So tension pneumothorax, you have more kind of a one-way valve mechanism. So every time they breathe in, air comes in, and when they breathe out, it's not able to get out. And what that does is build up pressure on that side of the lung, and that's not good because your lung can't fully inflate. Well, to actually define a tension pneumothorax, we have decreased lung sounds on one side, hypotension, because again, as this, this uh, air builds up on the side, it squeezes your heart, it squeezes your venous return, you can't get a good ejection fraction. And jugular vein distension, something we don't see that often. If you see it, they're pretty bad off. But again, that's where your heart and venous system are being squeezed, so you're not, blood isn't allowed to return the heart as much, so your jugular vein is actually gonna um, start getting big. You also get tracheal deviation as well. So to treat this, we're going to use a needle. You really want to use the largest, longest needle, and your protocols right now says 14 gauge, 3.25 inches. And in your SOGs, there are two places you can put them. Second intercostal space, mid-axillary line, or fifth intercostal space, I mean, sorry, mid-clavicle, or fifth intercostal space, mid-axillary. So if you feel your sternum, I mean, your clavicle, go down that first rib space, that's the first intercostal space. Down one more, that's the second intercostal space. So right in the middle of the clavicle, that's where you'd put it. Otherwise, fifth intercostal space, mid-axillary, is kind of around the nipple line, right below the nipple. This is actually, I was glad to see this in your protocols, because it's actually a better place to put it. You have much higher success rate in your fifth intercostal, intercostal space, mid-axillary line. You're going to insert 90 degrees, get a rush of air, and advance the catheter. Again, tip of the iceberg, most of the catheters that we use pre-hospital are going to miss about 60-70% of tension pneumothoraxis. Because especially in our population as it gets, it gets older and older, I mean older, bigger and bigger, you have a lot of tissue and fat and muscle to go through. So what they do, they do studies where they take CAT scans of people's chest or they go back and look at every trauma patient that got CAT scanned and they measure the distance between the chest wall and the lungs. And they're finding that a majority of the catheters we use actually won't ever make it to the lung. So you feel good putting that thing in, but it's not actually doing anything. So that's why the other studies they did that showed fifth intercostal space was much shorter distance. So that's why I'd advocate for that. Also, you're listening for a rush of air. I mean, you're flying down 95, you got lights and sirens on, and now you're listening for a little rush of air. It's very difficult. Uh, so again, um, really kind of listen. If you need to, you can take a syringe and put negative pressure on the syringe, and if you get air back in the syringe, you're probably in the right space. But don't be surprised if that needle doesn't do anything. I'll get to you in a second. Usually when you get to the trauma center, we usually take that catheter out, and it's completely kinked. So it never made it to the lung. So just so you know, if you have to re-attempt re with another needle, go ahead and try that. Abdominal trauma. All right, we're going to go over palpation. So palpation, just palpate all the quadrants of the abdomen. And just know things we worry about. Up here, the main thing, right upper quadrant, the liver. Left upper quadrant, worry about the spleen. Down here, we worry about appendix and some bowel. And over here, bowel as well. So trauma, it just it gives us a good picture of, yeah, it's really right upper quadrant really hurting them. Or, yeah, left lower quadrant is really hurting them. Again, just kind of guides our, our treatment and workup. What's this? Seat belt sign again. Yep, exactly. Just a lap belt. So that's not good. What's that? Uh, screwdriver. Leave that. Please leave that in. Do you want to put that in? Yeah. Leave it out. Cover with sterile gauze and moisten and just leave that out. <laughs> Let the surgeons take care of that. You probably won't put it right back in right. I, I wouldn't put it back in right. So just let the surgeons. What's up? Yeah, practically. <laughs> All right, uh, pelvic trauma. So palpation. Here's a video of how to palpate a uh, pelvis. We're gonna be pushing down and pushing in. There's some controversy to pelvic uh, exam. I'm just showing you this because it's actually an ATLS video, so what most people learn. But one thing, you don't want to rock the pelvis back and forth. You don't really want to do as much as he's doing, where he's really pushing down multiple times. You really want one good compression and one good back. If you feel it's unstable, hold it there. All right, and then. You don't want to, that's not when you say, hey, it's an unstable pel pelvis, everyone come feel. Because um, <laughs> what's the problem with pelvic fractures? Why do we worry so much? Blood, blood loss. So you can lose about a liter of blood in your pelvis, and that's a significant amount. So your pelvis kind of sits here like this, and then as the front of your pelvis, if it fractures, if you have an open book fracture where it goes like that, you have these bridging veins that tend to bleed, and just bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. And so 
what we want to do is bring that pelvis back together, try to tampen out the bleed. Because people can actually bleed out just with pelvic injuries, and it's kind of scary. Um, but we don't want to be going like this with the pelvis and having multiple people do it. It's tough because the only type of injury that we want a pelvic binder for is an open book where it goes like that. But you guys don't have x-ray vision. You can't really tell that. There's other ones. So you may see when we come to the trauma center, we may take the binder off. That's probably why. Because if it's a shearing one where it's like that, then what are you going to do? You're going to put the binder on and it goes like that. So maybe on our exam we think it's more of a shearing injury or based on their, their, what their legs look like or our initial x-ray. That may be why because that can actually cause more damage. Um, so just so you know, if it's, if it's broken in multiple parts, then when you put the binder on it might actually flare out and make it worse. But there's no way for you to really tell that. Uh, scrotal hematomas, mm. blood from the meatus, mm. uh, evidence of either a pelvic injury or a bladder injury itself. So badness. So again, you guys aren't getting that deep in your exam, but if you've noticed that, let us know, because that really helps us out a lot. This is just kind of some bad bruising, so probably, you can see he, down here, he may have landed on something, but uh, obvious bruising in the perineum, blood pooling down here, so probably a bad pelvic injury. So pelvic binder, it's important to know where we put it. We put it over the greater trochanters. We don't put it up on the top of the iliac crest. We don't put it down the femurs. Because what that's actually going to do, if you put it up here, the pelvis flares out and makes it worse. Put it down here, it makes it worse. So you want it on the greater trochanters. That's the most prominent part of your, of your hip bones that you can feel. So it's actually a little lower than you think. A lot of people want to put it up higher than you think. I think I have a quick video on here. Check the patient's clothing, belt, and pockets for any hard objects, such as a cell phone or keys. Next, locate the bony prominences on the side of the hips called the greater trochanters. These prominences are generally at the same level of the symphysis pubis and buttocks. This is the correct level for sling application. After you have located the greater trochanters, place the unprinted side of the belt under the knees and gently position the buckle off-center. With your hands beneath the lower buttocks, gently lift the patient approximately one centimeter. Then slide the sling up to the predetermined level. Check again to ensure that the sling is centered over the trochanters and the buckle is off-center. Next, insert the webbing through the buckle. Then grasp the fixed pull handle on the other side of the belt and pull the two handles in opposite directions. Pull until you feel or hear the buckle click or stop the belt. All right, any questions on that? that that's the uh, pelvic binder you guys have, the SAM pelvic binder. For yeah. Our trauma patients, mm -hmm. will we use that in conjunction with our backward protocols or no? Yes, so you're yeah, you, there are two separate protocols, your pelvic and your, and your backboard. He asked, in trauma patients, do they use that in conjunction? So yeah, the two separate protocols, if you have evidence of spinal injury, use your backboard. If you have evidence of pelvic injury on top of that, use your binder as well. Any more questions on that? All right, moving along. Extremity trauma. So we're going to go quickly over a neurovascular exam and then also some different findings you might see. So your neurovascular exam, check the pulses. Obviously, in whatever extremity that they're injured in, make sure they're getting distal perfusion. That's going to completely change our workup if you tell us they have this laceration and they also don't have a pulse. That, that changes what we do. Mark your pulse, especially on your DP. That helps us a lot if you mark it with a marker because DP can be kind of tough to find. And if they had it before and now they don't have it, again, that, that changes our treatment. Neurovascular exam, thumbs up with your toes. Make sure they can move stuff and feel stuff distal to the injury. Again, our neurovascular exam. So here's some wounds you may see. So just a bad laceration there on the left. We have some ex exposed tendon and other meaty stuff in there. And just a pretty bad one right there. You'll see that every now and then with motorcycles or a GSW. What's going on here? Dislocation. Yeah, shoulder dislocation. Looks different from the other side. Um, that helps. A lot of times people have done it many times before. They can tell you my shoulder's dislocated. But if you, if you kind of step back and look, you can tell something's not right there. What's happening here? Yep. Why do you say that? Okay, good. We have one shortened and rotated. So what you do, you put your thumbs on the medial malleolus, this little bony part right here, and check where your thumbs are. If one's a couple inches up, especially older patient you fell, high suspicion for a hip injury. What's going on here? So yeah, fracture, probably dislocation as well of the ankle. 
So this is definitely where you want to get that DP pulse. Um, you have a lot of important vasculature that runs under these bony prominences. So if you don't have a DP pulse, that's going to, right when we get the trauma center, we're going to be reducing that as fast as we can so they don't lose their foot. So the basics of splinting, you guys have all gone through splinting before, but splint in the position found. So if the arm's like this and obviously broken, don't wrench that thing back into position. Just splint it so they're comfortable. Make them comfortable for the ride. If, they, if you don't have a pulse, you do want to reduce it, especially femoral injuries. If you know there's a femur fracture and there's no pulse, you want to start reducing that to try to get your blood flow back. Sometimes you may not be able to because you guys, again, don't have x-ray vision. You don't know what the exact injury is, but if you at least try to reduce it to get blood flow, you may save a limb. Consider traction splint for femur fractures. It can reduce pain um, and also get blood flow back. Uh, do know that the second you hit the trauma doors, we're taking the traction splint off. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's just to get our x-rays and our workup. We're usually going to be pulling manually, take the splint off because we want to get it back to you and we got to do x-rays and CAT scans and stuff. And always check in your pulse motor and sensation after you splint. Badness, see this all too often. So how do you want to, how do you want to bring these in? How, how do you bag it? Bag it on ice. If you have, you can use a cold saline bag. Okay. Put it on there, or an ice pack. So the most important thing is not letting these get in direct contact with the ice or the water. Okay, because actually you can freeze the tissue too much, you can macerate the tissue. So here's, you want to, you can wash it off if you want with saline or water or just put it in the bag. You want to wrap it in gauze, put it into a bag, and then put that bag in ice or cold water. It's very important because most of the times nothing happens with these. We aren't able to salvage them. Uh, we don't have hand surgeons. Most places around here don't, or a hand surgeon on call. So if we really want to replant something, we usually have to fly them to Gainesville or Orlando. So we really need this tissue to be in the best condition possible. I have flown someone to Orlando before, only to have the... Uh, the transplant doc, the replantation doc, called yelling at me because the nurse had put those directly into a bag of water. And so by the time they got there, they were just macerated nastiness. There's nothing they could do. So again, to give them the best option, wrap it in gauze, put it in a bag by itself, and then into a bag of ice or water. You don't have, they're gonna ask you, can they replant these? Safe bet, just say they're gonna do everything they can. So here we got a wrist slack. So kind of common injury, I've seen some pretty bad bleeds from these. Um, I actually saw uh, one time when I was a student, a cut about half that size that was right here. A guy was working on a house, actually put his arm through the window, came to us dead because it cut that big right here, blood out on scene. Um, so they can bleed impressively, especially here we have arterial, the radial artery running right through there. Um, obviously amputations, we've got to worry about bleeding. You should be surprised that some amputations don't bleed. The vasculature tends to spasm down a lot, and actually you'd think this is terrible, but you might get worse bleeding from this than from the amputation. Um, but if it is bleeding at a life-threatening rate, what are we gonna do? Okay, so for bleeding, obviously all the time, always, always, always direct pressure. Majority of your bleeding is gonna stop from simple direct pressure. Don't worry about elevation, don't worry about pressure points. Direct pressure, put gauze on it. If it bleeds through that, put more gauze on it. Really, I've had patients in the hospital, in the ED, I've been on top of the stretcher like this just keeping them and it, it sustained them and not to a tourniquet but really putting all your weight onto that whatever artery is, is the problem you can you can stop most bleeding tourniquet so this is directly out of your SOGs to control potentially fatal extremity hemorrhage only after other means of hemorrhage control has failed so tourniquets have gone through a change in the last decade or so we used to think only it was a military thing and oh my god they're going to lose their leg uh, but First off, we'd rather have people alive without a leg than dead. That, that's true. Uh, secondly, people can go a long time with a tour tourniquet on and still do okay. There's orthopedic surgeries they do where they have a tourniquet up two to four hours. And then they, for the surgery, they take it off and the limb still does okay. So we'd rather people come in alive with a tourniquet on and then we can treat them afterwards. And so this is becoming pretty popular in EMS. A lot of police systems are using tourniquets as well. There's just a nice art article out recently showing a really high success rate with police officers placing tourniquets and having a good effect. So tourniquets are be becoming much, much more acceptable to have you come in with a patient with a tourniquet, but only if your direct pressure uh, has been tried first and failed. So this is what you guys have, the soft tourniquet, soft T. This is the one you currently use. And it's good to remember, these tourniquets are for extremity in injuries. So this tourniquet is made to go around a leg, around a leg, around the arm. There's other areas of hemorrhage we can have in 
folds and the axilla in the groin that take a special type of tourniquet. You guys don't have it. We don't have it in the trauma center. But just know you may actually see an injury and be like, oh crap, I can't tourniquet this off. It's not possible. And so you probably don't want to use it. You just want to utilize direct pressure. Don't use them on neck injuries. They tend to do that as well. All right, remember, the patient has lost blood, not saline. So don't overdo the fluid resuscitation. There's a trend in trauma medicine. We used to, oh, hang two liters, and after that we'll see if they're hypotensive. We're not even hanging, hanging that much anymore. If someone comes in, severe bleeding trauma patient, we're starting blood immediately. Because again, they didn't lose saline. That's not a problem. They're not a sick septic patient who's fluid down. They're a young dude that got shot and lost two liters of blood in the street. So we're actually hanging blood early. So yes, if they're hypotensive, follow your protocols, but don't feel like you gotta get three liters of blood in them before, or fluid before they get there. Just gentle fluids are fine. If they're a little on the hypotensive side, that's okay. We actually allow hypotension in the trauma center because we, if we boost the pressure too much and give them too much blood, it actually make things worse. But by giving too much fluids, if they get five, six liters of fluids, they're actually worse off. That much saline it actually causes coagulopathies and you don't clot as well. And it makes the person cold. And both, both those things tend to kill, kill trauma patients. All right, here's a quick video on tourniquet. Slide it over the extremity, all the way up. Once it's high up on the extremity, we're gonna tighten the tourniquet, take all the slack out of it. Once it's tight, I'm gonna turn my windlass device until the bleeding has either stopped or slowed down. Once that's occurred, I'm just going to secure it in the delta clip, and that's it. So that windlass is what makes a tourniquet a tourniquet. Without a windlass, it's not a tourniquet. There are some other ones on the market that use elasticity, but it's the same type of thing. An extension cord wrapped around the leg is not gonna do much, okay? So sometimes you'll come on scene and someone cut themselves and they wrap an extension cord around them, Go ahead and take that down if you can and get a true tourniquet if you, if you need it. Because it's good to know if that it's probably not doing anything for one. And if they really need a true tourniquet, I'd rather have yours on there. So when they come in with four feet of extension cord wrapped around, I'd rather have that off because they may not need it because it's probably not actually doing the job. So go ahead and take that off. Put one of yours on um, so we can have a, a real device on there. That windlass is what actually tightens it down because arterial pressure is not an easy thing to stop. If I go like this, I've stopped my venous pressure. But you really have to push down to stop your arterial pressure. All right, burns. <coughs> very unfortunate injuries to see. Different types of burns, as you guys know. First degree, very superficial. Second degree, we start getting down to the dermis. You may have some blistering. And third degree, you're getting down into the musculature and deep tissues. So second and third degree are really what we care about. That's the one when you're counting how much area is burned, count the second degree and third degree. Don't count the first degree. That's not what we're worried about. All of our equations we used for fluid resuscitation and our protocols to send to a burn center are based on second and third degree. Where's our closest burn center? Gainesville. So if they meet burn trauma criteria, they will come to us, but we're not actually a burn center. We stabilize and send them out to Gainesville. So the rule of nines, this is a picture from the JAX EMS site. I have a burn calculator up on there for you. Uh, but this is for adults. So the front of the chest, 18. Front of the back, uh, back is 18. The head, the whole head is nine. Uh, each leg is nine front and back, and the groin is one. And the arms are 4.5 each side. So you add all that up, it adds up to 100. It's one of those things I don't, I, another thing I cannot remember in my head is rule of nines. So every time I know a burn's coming in, I pull out some sort of guide to guide me on calculating it, because I can't keep these straight in my head. You can also use the patient's palm, which is 1%, about 1% of the body. Pediatric, you can see the pediatric changes a little bit. Their head accounts for more relative uh, body surface area. So again, pediatrics have a little different. And there's some different calculations based on age, but in general, that's, that's the rule that you use. <coughs> Um, so this is a typical first degree burn, sunburn. That's classically a first degree burn. Second degree, you're getting some blistering and down through the actual skin layers. And third degree, this is probably a, a bad second into third degree. And this is actually a patient that you guys brought me three years ago in the trauma center. What happened to this guy? Okay, this is a guy working on high wires. Grabbed the wire with his hand, burned the crap out of him, and then fell 30 feet off the cherry picker. So bad, bad, badness. Um, but you can see the extensive burns. We, he was actually, unfortunately, completely awake and with it. We intubated him for pain control and to get him to the, to the burn center. Um, but you can see this muscle tetany he had. So he probably held on to that wire for a while. 
um, because that, that was AC current, and AC current tends to cause tetany, and you just hold on to it. So some things we worry about here. First off, why do we worry about circumferential burns? So if this burn goes around its whole body, what do we worry about? Constriction. Constriction. Problem is now you get inflammation, burns immediately, just fluid starts shifting to it, you get bad inflammation, suddenly you can't breathe. So what happens sometimes is what we call an escherotomy, where we actually take scalpels down the chest and the abdomen and cut the superficial layers and allow that chest to expand out. And the crazy pictures you'll see, well, they'll get four or six inches of expansion from the fat and muscle, but if we didn't do that, they can't breathe and they die. Right here, this guy also has a problem, he'll end up losing his hand. Not surprising, because he had compartment syndrome here, because he had so much uh, swelling that it just cut off circulation to his hand. He got to the trauma center, he had no pulses in that arm or hand, and he said, well, we can't do anything, we're going to do an escherotomy, but that hand's lost, like that's the least important thing. Um, so again, it helps us to know circumferential burns, because we might have to do some immediate measures. What's wrong with this one? So, so it could be a couple things. Smoking auction, barbecue, meth lab, one of them. Um, but what we worry about here is the singed nose hair, the singed facial hair. What that tells us is possibility of inhalation burns. So you could actually have good thermal burns going down the airways. And so what that helps us know is if we need to evaluate the airway a little more. A lot of these people come in looking like this guy, awake, but what we'll sometimes do is sedate them a bit, put a camera down. If I see burns down his trachea, and burns, I'm gonna go ahead and just intubate him. Because again, as that swelling happens, they're gonna stop breathing. Um, but singe nose hair, coughing up soot, a lot of that helps us know if we need to evaluate their airway a little bit more. So this is your burn trauma alert. So second, third degree burns greater than or equal to 15% adult and greater than or equal to 10% in the peds is what you'll activate a, a burn trauma alert for. So treatment wise, IV fluids start with normal saline at 20 milliliters per kg, max at two liters. These people end up getting a lot of fluid while they're in the hospital. And we have a specific formula we go by called the Parkland formula to know how much we need to give them over the next 24 hours. So if you can tell us how much you gave and when you started, that helps because it's actually a component of that formula is how much have they gotten already. And that helps us calculate to 24 hours. Chemical burns irrigate with normal saline for 20 minutes, except all these things. And then, unless someone has a bag of this and they're showing it to you, this is what burned me, it might be kind of tough. So I don't know, you can either get hazmat involved or try to look for any um, hazmat placards around you to know what it is because a lot of these can be activated by fluids and water. So that's when you have more powder burns, you want to go ahead and brush it off. But again, just know there are some that you actually don't want to irrigate. Wound care, you're going to do dry, sterile dressings, leave blisters intact, and pain control. These people are in excruciating pain when they come in. Please give them pain control. Don't go popping blisters either. And traumatic cardiac arrest, got a couple more things will be done with this. Uh, per your protocols, there's no different difference from medical cardiac arrest. So really in the field, there isn't. If you have a high suspicion for pneumothorax, you could do a needle decompression. You treat massive hemorrhage, tourniquets, direct pressure. Other than that, you're gonna do your same ACLS. Having said that, there's almost no evidence for it. And the, again, the person's not having a heart attack because of a myocardial infarction, they've lost a lot of blood. So stop the bleeding, and that's really gonna be your best bet. Trauma airway, what makes this airway difficult? What's that? Position? Blood? Can't really move the head. Exactly. So these airways suck, and I'm really kind of trying to push more and more to not have these airways happen in the field uh, because there's better ways to do it. And if you have to do it, you have to do it. But this is not an ideal airway. He has blood, it's nighttime, he's got an audience around him, there's facial trauma, he's kneeling in the street, and C-spine immobilization. This is about the worst airway I can possibly think of. Uh, you guys have King Vision now, we'll go over that. But on these patients in the trauma center, 100% of the time, 95% of the time, I'm using at least a video lar laryngoscope because you get that C collar on, you're not getting your proper visualization. So this airway really sucks to try to do in the street. So I really push for you to not muck around with this airway. One, because they need to get to the trauma center. Their definitive treatment is a trauma center. So they need to get there as fast as they can and then we can take care of the airway when we have all of our backup, all of our fancy equipment. So if you can drop a king tube in these people, great. If you're bagging them, and they're keeping good sats and you're five minutes from the trauma center, great. I'd rather you get there in five minutes bagging them than spend 20 minutes on the street trying to get this and maybe not getting the airway. Unfortunately, we see a lot of traumas coming, not a lot, but a good amount of traumas and some in cardiac arrest where you later find out the tubes in the esophagus. 
We've had it in pediatric patients too, and you don't want that. You don't want that kid to have maybe died because we didn't get a proper airway. And the intubations in the field are already low because you guys don't get numbers. And the, this, and the, I'll never intubate someone this. I have the glory of a beautiful lit place with all the help I need with a person, at a pa patient at a specific height. But this is a really tough intubation. So if you can avoid it, and you're near trauma center, go ahead and get them there. If they're GCS three to five and they're breathing on their own, and they're 100%, that's fine too. Get it, just get into the trauma center. So consider bag valve, king tube, and rapid transport. So take home points. Stop life-threatening bleed. Direct pressure works. Majority of the time it works. Tourniquets are okay to use as well. Don't be hesitant. If you think you need a tourniquet, put it on. Worst case scenario, we take it off when you get there. Consider life-sustaining measures, so needle decompression, occlusive dressing. And don't overdo it. If bag valve mask or king tube work, use it, get into our trauma center, and the patient did not lose saline. So give them some saline, but do not overdo it. Do not feel like you need to flood this person with fluids. And again, that's the tip of the iceberg. A lot more to talk about, but this is at least a good intro for you guys.